Hello and welcome to the 6.4 in gas exchange. So as you can see, uh, we're going to be going through this presentation. This is going to hit all of the main ideas. It'll be a good idea for you to follow along with both the textbook and also the learning map. That way you can go back and you can refer to the learning map or fill in any gaps that you might have. Now I will say that this presentation is not the be all end all, but everything that we cover here is really the essential ideas of what we would like you to take away. I'll apologize for any extraneous noise that comes in the background as we go through this, so just kind of bear with me. Um, and you can kind of follow along with the pointer and then there are gonna be some effects. So the first thing we wanna go and talk about is the idea that ventilation is occurring all the time. Now, as you can see, we've got three things occurring here. We have ventilation, gas exchange, and cell respiration. And if we look at this, ventilation is the process of bringing fresh air into the alveoli and removing the stale air. It maintains that concentration gradient of carbon dioxide and oxygen between the alveoli and the blood in the capillaries. And this is incredibly vital for oxygen to diffuse into the blood from the alveoli and carbon dioxide out of the blood into the alveoli. And as we realized when we were talking about the circulatory system, the capillaries is where this happens. So if we look at gas exchange from the alveoli to the blood, that is occurring within the capillaries and the alveoli. But gas exchange itself is the process of swapping one gas for another. In this case, it's going to be oxygen and carbon dioxide. And it occurs between, or it, it occurs in the alveoli of the lung. Oxygen is going to diffuse into the capillaries from the air in the alveoli, and carbon dioxide diffuses out of the capillaries and into the air of the alveoli. And this happens through this process called passive diffusion, which means that there is no energy that's taking place. Think of it um, when we talk about it later, it'll be about from a high concentration to a low concentration. And the constant fluctuation of the inhalation and exhalation in this ventilation process is really what drives that to continue. Otherwise, if we didn't have the ventilation process, it would become stagnant and just become even. And one key point here is that you don't want to confuse physiological respiration, which comprises these three processes, with what I'll talk about now, which is cell respiration. And as you can see from the, the image there, cell respiration is what's happening in every single one of our cells. And that's what, what oxygen is required for. So cell respiration releases the energy in the form of ATP so that the energy can be used inside the cell. Cell respiration occurs in the mitochondria, which you can see the little picture here, and the cytoplasm of cells. And so oxygen is used in that process. And then carbon dioxide is the byproduct and that's what gets released by our cells back into the bloodstream, into the, the capillaries and the tissues, and then all the way back up into the lungs and through the heart to then be exchanged once again. So in summary, to maintain the concentration gradients of oxygen and carbon dioxide in the alveoli, we have to inhale and exhale and use that ventilation. So that's super important. And the ventilation system makes all of that possible by getting rid of the carbon dioxide in the alveoli and then bringing in more oxygen. So you can see from the image below the different concentrations and what happens as the oxygen-rich blood is flowing down in through to the tissues and then back out as it's carbon dioxide filled or oxygen or deoxygenated back into the lungs. So it's important that we understand some of the lung structures, right? I don't want to focus too much on this, but the key parts, you can see that from the largest to the smallest, we go the trachea, down into the, the bronchus, and then down into the bronchioles, and then down into the alveolus, or alveoli, which is plural. At the same time, if, if you look at the image on the right, you can see that there are these different muscles, which we'll talk about in a minute. Specifically, we have this huge muscle called the diaphragm, which helps to relax and pull the lungs down. And then these other muscles called the intercostal muscles. 
So there's an external and there's an internal. So we are gonna talk about that in just a few minutes. But to focus a little bit more on the alveoli, where the magic happens, and that gas exchange occurs. So you can see here that even though the alveoli are really small, that there's a huge number of them, and that results in a really large surface area for this gas exchange to occur. And you can see that we've got the focus here for the alveolus, but in the zoomed in version, you can see that huge airspace in the middle. So the wall of the alveoli is made up of this single layer of thin cells, and then so are the capillaries. So that means there's only just a few layers that diffusion needs to happen with the gases, the oxygen going in, which you can see from the arrows into the bloodstream, and the carbon dioxide flowing out. So this allows for it to happen really fast and without any energy. So the alveoli, which are right here, they're covered with a dense network of capillaries. This has low oxygen and high carbon dioxide. So because it's go high carbon dioxide to low oxygen, that diffusion gradient is, once again, allowing oxygen to diffuse into the blood and carbon dioxide to diffuse out. And we'll talk about these specific cells in the alveolar walls that help to secrete a fluid that keeps the inner surface of the alveoli moist and which allows gases to dissolve. So that fluid is, it's got what's called a natural detergent and that also prevents the sides of the alveoli from sticking together. So it creates this moist layer. So overall, this, this increases the surface area, all of these alveolus or alveoli, and this is where the gas exchange happens. So to talk about these very thin layers, and these, these special types of cells, the walls of the alveoli contains these two types of cells called pneumocytes. We have type one pneumocytes, which you can see up here, Type 1 pneumocytes cover most of the surface, about 97% of the air sac, and they're responsible for the gas exchange itself. And you can, we'll talk about them in a second, but type 1 cells are about twice as numerous as type 2 pneumocytes, which are larger and they're rounder, but they're the ones that produce and secrete this liquid that contains what's called a surfactant. And the surfactant reduces surface tension and pre prevents the sides of the alveolus from sticking to one another. So on the other hand, type 1 pneumocytes can't divide, but if they're damaged, type 2 cells can divide to replace them. It's kind of a funky play there um, if there's lung damage that occurs. So to kind of look at the image, you can see that in the, the magnified area, in the highly magnified area, that type 2 pneumocytes are the ones that are more circular, whereas the type 1 pneumocytes are very flat. And you can see in the car cartoony picture that the flat pneumocyte, type 1 pneumocytes, are covering most of that surface area, and that's where the gas exchange happens, where the type 2 pneumocytes are the ones that are secreting that pulmonary surfactant. So that's, those are the two specific kinds of alveolar cells that you need to be able to distinguish between. So to zoom in once again, you can have a look at the image and you can see the capillaries as well over on the left side. And you can see the erythrocytes, so the red blood cells, where the oxygen exchange is occurring. All right, and the alveolus itself is this huge, mainly gas-filled region with the surface area, and you can see that you have the type 1 pneumocytes, once again, very flat, and the type 2 pneum pneumocytes, which are the ones secreting that surfactant. This next slide talks about how inhalation and exhalation works. So what I'm going to do is talk through the process of inhalation, and then I'll talk through the process of exhalation or exhaling. And that way you're gonna get an idea of which muscles are contracting, which muscles are going to then move to, to decrease and increase the volume. So follow along in the learning map and that's gonna really clarify things. And we'll look at the image at the top right for inhalation and the image in the bottom right for exhalation. When you're inhaling, first the external intercostal muscles contract, right? This moves, as you can see over here, this moves the rib cage up and out. So at the same time, the diaphragm also contracts into a flattened position. You can see it kind of flattening out. It never really gets completely flat, 
but it flattens out. And as it does this, it moves down in order to increase the volume. So both of these contractions, the muscle contractions, increase the volume in the thorax. So if you recall, the thorax is the, the big air-filled area, okay? And once those contractions from the external intercostal muscles and the diaphragm take place, that increases the volume and also then drops the pressure below what's atmospheric, which is the outside conditions. So as this happens, the pressure is reduced and air flows because it's going from high concentration to low concentration from the lungs outside the body or into the lungs from outside the body through whether it's the mouth or the nose and then through the trachea into the bronchi and into the bronchioles. All right, and air continues to enter the lungs until the pressure inside the lungs rises to the atmospheric pressure. So when you take a super deep breath, when you do that, you get to a certain point and you feel like you can't take any more breath in. This is your lungs, your muscles kind of contracting to their fullest, but also that atmospheric pressure hitting the point where it's at the atmospheric pressure and it's not going to be able to take in anymore in an easy way. So that's the process of inhalation. One thing that it's important to point out is that the muscles work antagonistically, which means that they work oppositely. So the inhalation muscles or the inspiration muscles work are different from the ones that help us to exhale or expirate. So when we talk about exhalation, the kind of opposite occurs. So you can see that the internal intercostal muscles start to contract. And you can also see that the external intercostal muscles relax. So as the internal intercostal muscles contract, the rib cage moves down and it moves in. And also at the same time, your, your abdominal muscles contract. So this pushes the diaphragm up and back into kind of that dome shape. So both of these contractions then decrease the volume of the thorax, all right? So it's kind of like it's being squeezed. And as a result of this, the pressure increases. So the pressure rises above atmospheric pressure, and then air starts to quickly flow out of the lungs to outside the body through the mouth or the nose, whatever you're breathing out of. And air continues to flow out of the lungs until the pressure in the lungs has fallen back to atmospheric pressure. So it's important to understand how the different muscles contract, when they contract, what that does to the volume when you look at you know, how these play. Similar to what's happening with the heart when there are contractions taking place, what valves are open, etc. So it's important. So above that you can see that gases are going to move from that region of high pressure to a region of lower pressure. So it's like the concentration gradient. All right, so this is how exhaling and inhaling work. So once again, we have some different muscles that deal with inspiration or expiration. So inhaling and, and expirating. Um, you can see that there are you know, core muscles and then we have the accessory muscles um, to just kind of show those for you and, ha and how those work different. So as we're talking about the lungs, one of the extensions that's, that's super important to understand is that our lungs are working all the time. When you watch the Ed Puzzle video, you're going to see that we go through about 10,000 liters of air every single day. So anything that comes into our lungs can potentially cause harm or damage. And it's important to understand that, that lung cancer itself is is one of those, okay? So we'll talk about lung cancer and we'll talk about emphysema. But in talking about lung cancer, specifically, it's a cancer. So it, it's an uncontrolled proliferation of lung cells. And all of a sudden, you can see that this gives rise to a tumor. And as you might imagine, any tumor that forms, depending on where it forms, is going to impact alveoli. Tumors can be there. Tumors can either be cancerous, which is malignant and then move on to other regions, or they can be benign, which means they kind of stay in place and they don't really cause widespread damage. Now, as I said, you can imagine that 
any damage to your lungs or any tumor is going to impact how we use our lungs. So, you know, we can talk about the causes of lung cancer. Smoking is, is probably the, the biggest um, and the one that's probably most well known. But in addition, there can be air pollution, um, including things like asbestos, which is this dust that coats the lungs and, and really impairs the alveoli function. And then other infections or genetic predispositions. So you can see the causes down here on the, the right side. Don't need to go into that. But in general, somebody who has lung cancer displays symptoms of coughing up blood or wheezing or respiratory distress, and then, you know, as well as, as weight loss. So another major disease associated with the lungs is emphysema. And emphysema is this lung condition where the walls of the alveoli are losing some of their elasticity due to some sort of damage. And just like lung cancer, one of the major causes of emphysema is smoking. And what happens is the chemical irritants that are in cigarette smoke cause damage to the alveolar walls. All right, and you can, you can look at the comparison of the normal alveoli and the emphysema alveoli. So what happens is the damage to the lung tissue leads to this enzyme, the phagocytes in the area of the alveolus to re release this enzyme called elastase. And what happens is elastase, as you might imagine, it's got the A's ending. It breaks down the elastic fibers in the alveoli wall. This is an important thing. And when you lose that elasticity, it can no longer take in as much air anymore. And, you know, some of the common symptoms, because you can't take in as much air, includes shortness of breath, um, an increase in the amount of phlegm or mucus that's produced, because you can't get that out. And the rib cage becomes expanded. And then, additionally, you become more susceptible to chest infections, because your body's not able to, f to get rid of the mucus that is a part of that defense mechanism that we talked about in 6.3. So one of the other pieces that we need to talk about is how we can measure somebody's breathing. Now there's a machine that's called a spirometer and a spirometer is a special machine. You can see a picture in the book if you wanna look more closely, but it, it involves measuring the amount of air coming in and how fast that air can be inhaled or exhaled. All right, it looks like a a goofy little machine you have to wear a nose clip and you you know bring in air through a filter and etc um, and and the simplified version or the the more old school version this is a digital here on the display um, but in the book it, it's more of the traditional version now what I want to do is just kind of look at that uh, because it's important to understand how to read the chart so this charts the one that's taken from the book and and so as you can see, our lungs usually have a capacity of six liters. If you look, there's kind of a resting capacity. The total lung capacity is about six liters, which represents all of this on the y-axis. The vital capacity is the volume that can always be exchanged from a maximum inhalation and then exhaling. So if you notice, we also have this area up here called the residual volume. And the residual volume is volume that is always present in the lungs. Even though you try to get as much air out when you exhale, you still have some that's left over. You never actually get rid of all of the air in your lungs. So that's called the residual volume. And it represents just about 20% of the total lung capacity. In between there, we have what's called this tidal volume. And think of a tidal volume kind of like a waveform. And that's showing how much air is normally exchanged during every single breath. So if you were to take this test, put your mouth up to it with a nose clip on, and you would take a few breaths, and you would be inhaling air as it's going down, and then you would be exhaling air as it's going back up. All right, and that kind of continues as you're taking your normal breaths. And then what the doctor would have you do is they would have you completely take a very deep breath. And so you inhale, and you get to, and then you exhale as much as you possibly can, 
which is that huge spike on the y-axis. And then after you exhale, then you have to obviously intake air again and kind of get back to normal. But you can see it takes your, takes your lungs a little bit of time to kind of get that breathing back to normal. So that's kind of what that represents. And you can look at a spirometer during activity, during like exercise, and after activity to kind of compare what normal breathing is versus breathing after some sort of activity. So that's it. To kind of backwards recap, we have talked about spirometry, all right? We talked about how and, and why that happens and, and the importance of being able to, to monitor and measure using this device called the spirometer. We talked about emphysema and we talked about lung cancer, some of the causes and consequences. Uh, we talked about how, how exhaling and inhaling occur and what's happening with the muscles and the volume and the thorax. Uh, we also talked about the alveolus itself as a special structure that contains these two types of pneumocytes, right? with type 1 being thin and type 2 being the, the thicker ones that secrete that surf, surfactant. So we talked about that the alveoli in particular is where that gas exchange is happening and, and why that occurs there. We talked about some of the lung structures and the different lung structures that are important for you to know, both the muscles and the, the tubes from larger to small. Um, and then the last thing here, just kind of looking at the, the three kinds of processes that involve physiological respiration. So ventilation, gas exchange, and cell respiration. And hopefully you've got an understanding of how these kind of play in. So hope this is helpful. Try to get better at this as it goes along. Let me know if there's anything that you need, or let me know if you have any questions. I'll be more than happy to point you in the right direction, whether it's in the book, whether it's to another video, whether it's just answering a question. So thank you much.